This is Penn Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. The date is April the 24th, 1971. I'm at the Lincoln Plaza Inn. This is the day of the 1971 annual Western Heritage Awards of the National Cowboy Hall of Fame and Western Heritage Center. Each year, and it, one or more individuals may receive special recognition from the Cowboy Hall of Fame for outstanding contributions to some field dealing with uh, the West uh, over a long period of time. And today I'm interviewing one of these individuals whose name is Yakima Knut. Uh, let me get the pronoun. Is it Knut? Yakima Knut. Yakima Knut. Uh, now, from reading his biography, I know that Yakima is not his real name, and though Yakima is an Indian name, that uh, he is uh, uh, Dutch and German and Irish instead of, uh, uh, instead of Indian. Why don't you tell us what your real name is and why, where you got the name Yakima? Well, my real name is Enos Edward Knut. And during the years of 1914, when I first started rodeoing, I traveled with a couple of boys from Yakima, and we all had a few drinks one day. And, Yakima, Washington. Uh, well, we were at Yakima, Washington, yes, but this particular place was at Pendleton ahead of the Roundup. And uh, one of the boys got on and got bucked off, so they got to kidding the Yakima riders. The other fellow got bucked off, so to help them out and build their name up, I said, don't bring out one and I'll show you what the Yakima boys can do. So they brought out another one, and I got bucked off, <laughs> and the name stuck. The photographer put Yakima Knut leaving the deck of such and such a horse, and the picture was run in the paper. The announcer took it up during the show, so I was stuck with it. The, uh, why don't you tell us while we're talking about background, wh where you were born and who your parents were and how you got uh, interested in horses? Well, I was born at Colfax, Washington. My father, who uh, was a descendant from the Dutch and German, and my father was not only a rancher, but a, quite a politician. In fact, he was a member of the legislature in the, uh, I think it was about 90, 1896. And my mother, of course, was Scotch-Irish, but I was raised on a farm and I got started riding bucking horses. In fact, I rode my first bucking horse when I was 11 years old, and it kind of gave me the bug. So at 16, I won my first contest, and from then on into the big major shows. Since this is an Oklahoma oral history program, we're going to talk uh, more about uh, Oklahoma than anything else, but uh, since you're a man who actually has had three careers, one in rodeo and one in, uh, uh, one in, uh, in, in s movie acting and stunt writing and then one in uh, directing and, uh, and uh, developing programs, why don't you give a very, very brief biography giving your whole background up to now? Well, during the rodeo days, of course, I, 1917, I won the all-around championship of the world, again in 1919, uh, 20 and 23. So I had a chance to go into pictures, uh, contract, so I left the rodeos and went under contract to an independent producer by the name of Wilson, who I made about 40 silent westerns. Or, and then talkies came in, my voice being what it is, didn't record too well, so I decided to take up stunt work. Then I had a nice long career of stunt work, which was very successful. In fact, I made better money at that work than I did as an actor. So I stunted up till I was 50 years old. My legs began to slow down. So I decided to uh, break off and start directing action. So I've been directing now for 25 years and still going along strong. Why don't you tell us some of the, just name some of the major movies that you had a direction part of? Well, the direction, I did direction in a lot of very big pictures. We'll start off way back with Helena Troy, uh, Richard and the Crusaders, Ben-Hur, which I did the race in, 
uh, Fall of the Roman Empire, El Cid, Knights of the Round Table, Ivanhoe, uh, Man Called Horse, uh, a song in Norway which is out now and doing very well, and many, many others. It's hard to just rattle them off here without thinking of them. How old are you now? How old are you now? Well, I'm now I'm I was 75 the 29th of last November. Are you directing anything now? Well, I'm all working on a deal that might get started in the near future. The, uh, now, thinking in terms of Oklahoma, why don't you tell me about some of the early rodeos in Oklahoma that you participated in? Well, I've actually, the rodeos in Oklahoma, I think 1920, 21, I believe, was the first time I came down through the... Uh, 1921 was the first I came down through the South, and uh, I played shows. Of course, I knew a great many of the Oklahoma boys uh, that came up north. In fact, they came up and won all of the money and the ropings all over the country until the fellows finally got to cutting down their ropes and getting faster horses. But I think, actually, that the ropers from this state are probably the finest in the world. I don't think they were ever equaled. And uh, bronc riding, I think some of us boys in the north did pretty good. But uh, there's a difference, in the, of course, in the stock that's used and the, the Oklahoma and Texas cowboy uh, developed the fast horse and the short rope tied hard and fast and they were roping that way in seconds when we were putting in minutes with the old Dally Weldy and 40 foot of rope. So there's quite a difference. Who's the, who are some of the finest Oklahoma ropers? Oh, some of the great ropers. Eddie Burgess, who was a, an Indian roper, and one of the top. Fred Beeson, Henry Grammer, Ben Johnson, and uh, Clay McGonigal. I don't know. I could go on and name them. It's but that's some of the some of the tops. The uh, did you know Will Rogers? I knew Will Rogers very well. Yes, I used to visit with him a lot in uh, near Santa Monica. In fact, I knew him before he came out to California when he was with the Zigfield Follies in New York. We were playing shows at Madison Square Garden, and I had the pleasure of meeting him, get a, getting acquainted there. <clears throat> and then in later years. Uh, when he came to California, I visited with him a lot. Can you recall any personal experiences with him or possibly any story that you were talking to him and telling him? Well, the only, of course, Bill, you know, when you was around Bill, he, he was the fellow that got all the laughs and did all the uh, talking, but I will recall one thing. Uh, I was getting ready to go to up into Northern California on a picture, and I met Bill one day, and he was doing a lot of flying over the country at that time with uh, Wally Post. And uh, when we were talking, he said, Jack, I understand you're doing quite a lot of wild stunts. You know, he said, you're getting a few years on you, you better kind of look out. And I said, Bill, this stunt work is not as dangerous as some of that flying you're doing all over the country. About three weeks later, he was killed. The, uh, do you recall any of the, uh, of course, his on-stage things have been pretty well recorded, but you can you recall any, uh, I understand he was a showman, whether he was on stage or not, can you recall any of the funny things that he did uh, off-stage in situations where you were with him that might be worth the hearing? Oh, it's pretty hard to pull them out. Yes, it's pretty hard to pull them out. Pick up with <laughs> Um, can you recall any experiences with him? We're particularly interested in Will Rogers, of course, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, can you recall? Uh, can you recall anything about Will Rogers that, uh, from a personal standpoint? Well, of course, the only thing I can recall about him is that he was one of the finest men I've ever known, and he certainly was a humorous supreme. I, in fact, I think the man could have been president of the United States had he have chose to run. 
He was that well liked, and he was smart, and I'm not too sure he would have been a great president. But I will say that he was humble, he was very kind-hearted, one of the finest men I've ever known. I've never heard him speak a bad word about anyone. Uh, if he didn't exactly like someone too well, he, he just wouldn't talk about them at all. And that, that's the kind of a man he was. The, um, can, you, uh, can you tell any experiences about any of the other early Oklahomans you were in common? Did you know Wiley Post? Wiley Post? Yes. Well, not to know. I not just met him in that was all. Uh, thinking of these other Oklahomans you mentioned, what can you tell us about them from a personal standpoint? For instance, these Wilfers, these early Wilfers, can you think of anything that was about their personalities or uh, personal experiences? Well, personalities, I tell you one thing about all of the Oklahomans that I have known seem to have that friendly warmth, uh, sense of humor, and uh, you could put a bunch of Oklahoma ropers together and there was always a lot of good laughs. And I remember one time watching a, uh, playing a show and there's one of the Oklahoma Indians and he drank a little and he was roping. The first day he roped a steer and jerked his horse down. He got a terrific fall. The second day, the same thing happened. And the third day when he rode up to the chute, <laughs> he Loopy said, I hope I don't catch. <laughs> uh, why don't you talk a little about rodeo then as compared with now? Well, in comparing rodeos in the old days and now, actually the rules are just about the same as they were when, uh, when I quit rodeoing back in 1923. Uh, there's a little difference in the riding and that and I, I, I you can't take it away from these young fellas I, I saw the Pendleton show two years ago and I was amazed at some of these kids that get out there and the way they rode so whenever you hear one of us old timers say they don't ride like they used to just don't you believe it they're right on the ball it's naturally like any other sport the farther it goes, the longer it exists, the, the better they, they work. Records broke every day, and rodeos find the same thing. What uh, was the most exciting rodeo in Oklahoma that you would call? You know, the early ones of the year, about the year. Well, I, I played a little show in Oklahoma. I think it was Ada, Oklahoma. And there was only a few bronc riders and a few bulldoggers. But there was a thousand ropers there, and I have never seen such a roping. I recall the first day that or something like 14 seconds wasn't in the money. So when you get a bunch of ropers together like that, it's pretty, it's pretty rough. But it's really something to watch. About when was that? That was in 1922 or 3, 22, I believe it was. Might have been 23. How did you get into the movies from the rodeo? What? Well, having a lot of publicity and good reputation as a cowboy, a champion, the uh, producer that I went to work for decided that it might be a pretty good thing, so he gave me a contract to make a series of pictures. And they went over pretty good, so we made three series, about 48 pictures to be exact, and uh, then of course talkies, when they showed up, as I said, uh, my voice didn't register good, so I went to, uh, to doing stunt work, but I found that very profitable. Did you film any pictures or any sequences of pictures in Oklahoma? Any sequences? Did oh, you, to shoot? Did you oh, I shot, I shot one sequence at Lawton, Oklahoma, for the Disney what Studio, the, about, that. about 300 buffalo. And uh, this was, and I used local cowboys to help get them out the day before we started, explain things to them. And we put a buffalo stampede on the screen, one of the best I have ever seen. And 
without good help, and all you can't you can't get that kind of work done. What's involved in putting on a buffalo stampede? Well, in putting on a buffalo stampede, there's a lot of things involved. Any animal thinks for himself, tries to go where he wants to go, so you have to pick land, maybe canyons, or maybe or put in blind fences outside of your camera lines to bring them to or turn them at a certain point. But you have to build these fences and keep them all out of sight of the camera. And uh, sometimes it's rather rough, but we were certainly very successful in that picture. I, I think it's the best buffalo stuff that's ever been put on the screen. What do you think of the, uh, how does this buffalo herd uh, down there compare with any other herd you may have seen? Well, I admit to, to compare the different herds of buffalo, uh, naturally your buffalo at Lawton are in a smaller uh, pasture, you might say, reservation, and uh, the horsemen around them quite a bit, so they're not as wild as, take for instance, the uh, Yellowstone National Park. There it takes you about a week to get the buffalo in and corral them. They get away, you wait another week till they get them back. So, but it's they have a lot of territory to run in, and they don't, they're not used to horsemen and fellas around them too much. Can you think of uh, what was the name of the station show? I don't believe you told Oh, I can't tell you the name, but I was under contract for Disney for a while doing shots for different pictures, and this was one of these. One of these westerns with Slim Pickens and through the other. In fact, uh, Slim did a very good part in the picture, but I couldn't really give you the name of it right now. What other Oklahomans have you? Uh, or what other have you done any other films besides this Lawton thing? Have you done anything else? In that's Oklahoma? the only. That's the only picture I did anything in Oklahoma. Uh, let's talk. Uh, let's think in terms of Oklahoma. Audrey or others that you... Oh, I've, uh, Gene Audrey, I know Gene very well. Oh, in fact, uh, when he first came to Hollywood, Nat Levine, whom I used to do stunt work for, made a lot of serials and westerns. So Nat called me one day to come over to his office, and I went over and he said, there'll be a fella in pretty soon I want you to meet. So a fella came in, and I was introduced to Gene Audrey. We talked for an hour or so, and so Gene left, and Nat says, what do you think of him? And I said, for what? And he said, I'm going to make a singing cowboy star out of him. And I said, well, Nat, up now, I thought, I thought you were pretty smart, but I, that's making a singing star out of somebody overnight is pretty hard to do. He says, well, I think, I think he's got it. And he had it. His, from his first picture on, the fan mail started coming in, and he went right on into the big money and more power to him. He's a real nice fellow. I've worked with him a lot, directed him in a lot of stuff, and I found him very cooperative, and he's really a businessman, too. What other uh, Oklahomans have you worked with? Right? Well, in the picture and business, they, I, oh, Hard to pick the names up right now. Uh, young Ben Johnson, of course, I worked with him quite a bit. In fact, I tried to get the uh, Republic Studios to make a series, let me make a series with him of westerns when he first came to Hollywood. But they didn't think he had it, so Ford saw him one day and put him to work in the picture, and he's been doing pretty good since. Another Oklahoman, Jack Mulhall, whom I worked with in some of the old-time serials. And quite an actor, quite an active man. Tell us something about Jack Mulhall. Some, tell us something about him in your experience. Well, Jack, Jack was a well, he had a great sense of humor, and he, uh, he worked hard. And in those serials in that day, we used to do a two days work in one and about every other scene was a foot race or a fight or something and it was really tough going and Jack was doing his own stuff and I'll never forget all through the picture 
fight, 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 and he was fighting till he would give out. And I didn't see him for about a month, and I met him on Hollywood Boulevard one day, and he jerked his coat off, and here he come. <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the fights we were doing. Did you know uh, any of the 101 uh, people? Well, I knew the 101 show, that is, I've seen it, but uh, the Millers, I never did get too well acquainted with. The only fellow that I ever got acquainted with that was on that show I talked to several times was the old fellow that created bulldogging. He was a Negro, Negro picket. And I, in fact, he uh, got the, uh, saved the show in Mexico City. They showed there and they were not getting a crowd. In fact, they were in. The show was pretty well in hock. And finally, um, Zach Miller uh, figured that he would get the bull ring, advertised that Pickett would ride into the ring and get on a bull's head, stay there for 10 minutes. And they advertised this and they filled the bull ring with people. And Pickett actually rode in, his horse was hooked and quite a gash tore in his hip. And uh, he rode out and the people were starting to get up in arms. And in Mexico at that time, anytime you advertised to do something, you either did it or you went to jail. So Miller got a hold of Pickett, gave him a bottle, let him drink about a half a quart, and said, now get in there and get on that bull. So, I said to Pickett, uh, when he was telling me about this, and I said, what, uh, was you really scared? He said, I was scared to death. He said, but <laughs> I knew that if I didn't go, Zach would probably kill me and it just well let the tape or just well fight the bull and have it over with. So he went in, and he actually dove onto the bull and stayed on his head for 15 minutes. With finally, the Mexicans throwing beer bottles at him, one of them hit him in the side of the face and cut a hole through that he could stick his tongue through. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. And speaking of Oklahoma people, I'll jump back to 1931. I met a very nice, fine young lady from Oklahoma. A year later, we were married. And I want to say that that Oklahoma gal has given me 40 years of real happiness, a couple of fine sons, and a beautiful daughter. Her name was what? Uh, her maiden name was Jaeger, Audria Jaeger. Uh, she was born in a little town called Wilburton and then spent most of her childhood and teen years here in Mexico City. Or in Oklahoma City, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. can, you, uh, can you think of any other Oklahomans or any other Oklahoma experiences just back here? How about Jim Sheldon? Jim Sheldon? Well, I, I knew Jim, just knew him, and that's all. I never was around him enough to really get well acquainted with him. Uh, I do know that he was a terrific bull rider. What about the birth? The, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the birth? Birth? Birth. Well, up uh, there, in fact, I don't, uh, I haven't seen too many rodeos in the last few years. I just, uh, and there's a lot of these new boys that I haven't. Uh, I'm thinking of the older birth. Oh, the old, uh, the older birth. They, they seeking of a way to get some benefit for Oklahoma. Uh, I'm delighted with one thing. I think the Chamber of Commerce has uh, uh, now taken, uh, assumed a great interest in the development of the state of Oklahoma, whether it be uh, an industry for Oklahoma City or Oklahoma County or not. Mm -hmm. And I think this is as it should be, uh, not in a parental sort of a way. That isn't becoming to cities like Lawton or Bartlesville yeah. or Tulsa or Reno or Ardmore, but uh, uh, 
I feel that those cities have profited somewhat by this strong chamber of commerce that Oklahoma City has. I think they'll continue. I think that attitude shouldn't be changed. I think it should be developed. I think it, uh, they have uh, gained a tremendous momentum. True. Tremendous momentum over the years. And solidly based as well. Despite any uh, political differences that people have, and something that a, something or some group or individual who is extremely active can also turn out to be a very well, uh, very uh, ready target, so to speak. Well, Oklahoma City has achieved uh, <coughs> uh, prominence in various types of transportation. Uh, lately in the air, mm -hmm. with the uh, flight starting from here to Paris. Uh, this is good, but uh, we do have uh, sufficient recognition air-wise now to be uh, considered an important hub, That's right. and I think this is excellent. The other type transportation we'll spend more money on, it'll be many times slower but I can't help feeling that we'll have water transportation sometime. It may be the most expensive thing we ever brought into Oklahoma City, but it will uh, have the result of making this a more favorable freight rate area. It's the type competition and the only type that can do that, I think. That's right. The present competition between trucks and rail doesn't do anything or very little to <coughs> give this area a rate advantage, a freight rate advantage. Yes, very little. They are only fighting themselves and both of them are fighting for more tariff all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, air transportation, uh, we seem to have uh, uh, established a, uh, the facilities, the uh, groundwork that it takes to make this a, an important uh, air transport center. Mm -hmm. If we can now bring uh, a few barge loads of freight of some kind in here or out of here uh, to uh, take us off the, I used to call it the freight rate hump, mm -hmm. and that's still a good name for it because that's just where our Oklahoma City is and has been. Mm -hmm. All of our accomplishments uh, of the last many years have been in spite of <coughs> the fact that uh, this is a high spot from the Pacific Coast, from the Gulf Coast, mm -hmm. from St. Louis or Kansas City gateways. That's right. And uh, the, the one thing that could take us off that hump is perhaps, I think almost certainly, a waterway that is usable to uh, within a few miles of sure. Oklahoma City. And you know that Muskogee, Oklahoma one time had this very thing. Mm. And when Muskogee got uh, <coughs> a water rate on account of a steamboat having forced its way and made a landing at a prepared dock there in Muskogee. <laughs> uh -huh. This was before you came to Oklahoma. This was back in the 1908 and 9. Muskogee then had the opportunity of being the chief distributing city, let's say this side of Dallas, hmm. because of rates that they commanded. Somehow they, they missed the boat. They didn't have our Chamber of Commerce. That's about it. Well, that, it's going to take a few years, but uh, we're going to have it. We're going to have water transportation. I think we'll have water transportation. It's rather paradoxical, isn't it, that the slowest form of transportation is probably the one that uh, exerts the greatest influence on other forms of transportation. It's a, this, of course, is looking at it rate-wise. Well, yeah, that's what I said. Uh, what you said, rather, on the rate structure, it's uh, ex 
extreme influence. And it's amazing to uh, perhaps those who are not aware that uh, barge tonnage on the Ohio rivers, for instance, and Mississippi rivers increasing each year. Oh, damn. <laughs> now that's a pretty have, sight, uh, too, isn't it? That's a pretty sight to see a tow coming up the river. That's How they manage those tow boats with their thousand or fifteen hundred feet of barges ahead of them, I, I'll never understand. But uh, this, I think, must go off with the greatest skill on water. <laughs> And particularly well, these in rivers that, are not straight. I was going to say, in those crooked rivers, oh, yeah. full of sandbars, and, right. and uh, who knows, irregular bottom. They never cease to be of interest to me. I have, one of my hobbies for a good many years has been flying. And mm -hmm. uh, I have flown over the Mississippi from Minneapolis down to the oh, uh, juncture of the Ohio. Mm -hmm. Several times. Uh, Carroll. Carroll. Sometimes a little farther south than that. Uh, weather sometimes causes detours to a light airplane. <laughs> the pilot of my ability. <laughs> well, I never cease to marvel at these long towboats or uh, yeah. barge lines or <coughs> barges that Excuse me. are kicking up or kicking down the river. How long have you been flying? Some time. Nineteen thirty-five. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's the bonanza up there, huh? Now the bonanza wasn't built until nineteen forty-six. Yes, I owned one that was built in nineteen forty-seven. But uh, I began to fly in travel airs and. Uh, <coughs> Two or three other types of uh -huh. canvas and wood airplanes. Uh, I found out right soon after 1935 that I could could no longer afford it. <laughs> it was high priced when there was no object in it, just yeah. satisfy ones. Uh -huh. So there was quite a gap. Uh, I learned to fly in 35. There was quite a gap between that time and when I. Uh, got into modern airplanes like Bonanza's. Uh -huh. You still fly? Still own one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great fly? sense of accomplishment and great joy, isn't it? Well, <coughs> it's a, uh, to me, uh, a different world. Yeah. Somehow I Somehow or other, I forget. Uh, I can't worry about anything. I, I don't have any troubles in an airplane. Mm -hmm. I'm completely at ease. I'd much rather fly than drive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little hard on my family. <laughs> they don't always like to fly where I want to fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or when I want to fly. Uh, you still flying with Anza? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great airplane, real fine airplane. I like it. It's uh, they're expensive, but this is within the range that I perhaps can afford. Uh -huh. Do you do some flying? Yes, mm -hmm. I did. I haven't done any lately, but I. You never lose the yen to to really get back to it. I still want to get back and re refresh and get the ticket back again. So. Military flying? No, single engine. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of unofficial time in multi-engine. Yes. But, uh, which won't count, but uh, flying DC-3s with crew members, so I've flown a lot of them. Uh, one of my instructors, I remember, was a young fellow named Jack. Hmm. Not complimentary, that I can't think of his name right now. He's still flying, flies for Halliburton. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had a tremendous lot of hours in DC-3s. 
during uh, World War II mm -hmm. on the West Coast. He was a uh, crew chief or some of the time uh, uh, co-pilot. But it was illegal time, as he called it. Yeah. Jack yeah. Morris. A lot of mine's illegal, too. Uh, but mm. it's good. That is time you couldn't count in your long No, time. no. Marvelous training. Yes. It's a, it's a great old airplane. Well, I feel very at home in a single-engine plane. Uh, many uh, riders and flyers to the contrary. Uh, I'm not certain that more single-engine planes crack up than twin-engine planes. Well. Uh, and I feel <coughs> that I can put a Bonanza down in places where they couldn't begin to get a DC-3 down. Oh, yeah. Impossible to get a Convair down and a Constellation uh, or these big jets. Uh, they are just not made for emergency landing. <laughs> and a little ship like, like uh, Bonanza. Yeah. And I have flown many places where I felt that uh, where the only thing in sight was a railroad track, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'm mentally prepared in case of engine failure, mm -hmm. complete engine failure. But I'll just leave the gear up, put her right down on the rails, and let her coast until she's all until she's all done. Yeah. Uh, there are places in uh, Northern California and in Oregon that uh, be nothing else to land on up in that volcanic area. Uh -huh. Well, I think uh, whatever plane man uh, flies, he probably uh, evaluates its emergency characteristics. I should I, think so. I feel better in the small ones than I do in the big ones. <laughs> well, you still like to have your hand on it. You like to have a certain yes, amount of control. I, I like that. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a lot to do with it, I think. Now, you've piled up a few hours then, haven't you? I believe that my next even number will be 2,700. Mm -hmm. Quite a few, but that's not many compared to some. We have a man uh, with our company who has over 5,000, because <laughs> that is in the Air Force. Uh -huh. But he still won't land a Bonanza. He won't what, land? He won't land it. <laughs> and I, I think I understand his viewpoint. Yeah, he's used to the heavy he said, stuff. Uh, there's no object. Uh -huh. If anything did occur, uh, no reason why I should be landing this airplane. Uh, <laughs> and I feel the same way about driving someone's new car. Uh -huh. uh, no object in it at all, and I'd rather not. Hmm. An old car, my own cars, I, I love to drive, but if I got in your car and it were a new uh, Lincoln Continental or, or whatever, I would uh, probably say, no, thank you, if you ought to let me drive it. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything else that perhaps uh, we may have missed? I think I've probably rambled too far. No, I think that's good rambling, because uh, there are some things that perhaps if we'd prepared for it, you would not have included, and uh, we'd have missed. I only totally appreciate well, it. I'm very hopeful that uh, this business uh, was the basis for this interview was business, that this business will uh, go on. We have some very capable men in the business. Mm -hmm. I am more and more certain almost every day that a couple of them could do a better job than I'm doing. And uh, I think there will be distributing problems to be met, surmounted, profited by for years and years to come. <coughs> Not only this business, but other types of distribution. So it's my hope that this business will go past the 100-year mark. We're already three-fifths of the way there. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that uh, man up there on the wall really started something, didn't he? <laughs> Some of the early days were very interesting. Business began in those days at 7 o'clock. The business day ended at 6 o'clock. And it was dark in the winter at 7. It was dark in the winter at 6. <laughs> but we were here. Mm -hmm. On Saturdays, we closed at 5. Oh, big day. Big deal. Close at 5. All right. <laughs> Uh, my first job with the company uh, was at three dollars a week. All of that? And uh, I think within two years I'd come up to four dollars and a half. <laughs> and this was uh, very fair money for unskilled labor, yeah. but it was typical of uh, wages that were <laughs> paid up and down the street. Well, costs weren't so high those days either. That's true. So it's... Uh as they say, your dollar bought more. I wasn't conscious of being uh, <laughs> downtrodden <laughs> at those <laughs> prices. And, uh, uh, well, I, I hope that uh, this hasn't all been uh, inane or uh, <laughs> just an opportunity to let me talk for quite a while about uh, nothing in particular. Uh, I do a lot of reminiscing. Uh -huh. I'm told it's a sign of old age. <laughs> and this is probably true. Without <coughs> having the age, I couldn't remember the things that I do remember. Mm -hmm. So I don't quarrel with it at all. But I am glad that I have lived in this, uh, uh, the latter part of one century and the beginning years of another during those times, because there have been so many events, I well remember the uh, beginning of the Spanish-American War mm -hmm. and the uh, troop trains that came through uh, Silicate, Missouri. In fact, I almost got away with a bayonet from one of the boys. <laughs> uh, I remember very well that uh, uh, even after coming to Oklahoma, there was a very vivid remembrance on the part of a lot of people of the Civil War, of the heat, the passion, the hate, and so forth and so on. Uh, I remember the threat of uh, Indian War one time in Oklahoma. I remember some uh, very vividly some outlaw chases that uh, uh, during one of them, uh, Sheriff Garrison of Oklahoma County was killed. Uh, there were exciting times, there were other times of nothing but peace and prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> and but, work uh, hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cotton at uh, five cents was no stranger to Oklahoma at the time of Mr. Wilson's election, Woodrow Wilson, I think that was about 1912. Mm -hmm. We still raise a good deal of cotton. It commands a better price, but that's because, and it is raised in Oklahoma because uh, of the mechanical pickers, uh, because it can be handled in a mechanical way. I think this is a tremendous advance. But we talked briefly about livestock and how we see uh, Angus from one border to the other. That's right. Uh, how the uh, state has been drilled for oil in sections that oil was undreamed of 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, We're now a very large manufacturing state, and there's where we have ample opportunity to grow. Uh, Tinker, of course, FAA, Mecklenburg Duncan, all included in this. Uh, sometimes I feel uh, that we in the distributing business have not kept step with the great advance that Oklahoma has made. Perhaps it's the peculiarity of the business itself that you, you are stepping along with it, but it doesn't seem that way because of, of the nature of the business. We do business with a lot of friends. That I'm eternally thankful for. 
uh, having been here as many years as I have, I am having traveled the state as much as I have, I have met a lot of people, merchants, and my acquaintance over the state has been very large in that respect. And that's one of the satisfactions that the business brings, uh, doing business with friends. I should imagine. No, oh, I think you better turn that machine off. You'd let me ramble here. It'll there we cost go. you probably $10 in tape. Uh, I think we got a good one, though. <laughs>